Hello everyone. Right, so it's uh, EMF 2016, Sunday evening, Stage C, and I'm very happy to be able to introduce uh, Gavin Starks, who's going to be talking to us about uh, cosmology and uh, audio from that. So, uh, yeah, Gavin, take it away. Thanks. Thank you. Hey. Good evening. Um, my name is Gavin Starks, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, acoustics, music, and cosmology. Um, bit of a, an in curious mixture for me, and, and um, in to provide some context, uh, my background is originally in astrophysics. I used to work at this place, uh, Jodrell Bank, up in Cheshire, doing uh, radio astrophysics work, uh, observing quasars and uh, interesting astronomical objects. Um, also have a master's degree in electronic music and over the last 20 years or so I've been gradually kind of on cosmological time frames trying to bring these things uh, together in, in some way um, but just to set some context on uh, you know what are we what are we listening to I think you know there's lots of different ways of listening to the universe that um, are maybe a bit unexpected uh, this is uh, the sound of a satellite going around Jupiter uh, so around Saturn, as it goes around the side, you can hear it sort of crashing through. The kind of, this is a, just literally tri equivalent of tuning your radio in to the uh, the, the frequencies that it was, it's picking up as it went round uh, the horizon. There, um, one of my favourites from Jodrell Bank, as I'm assuming everyone's familiar with pulsars. Pulsars were actually discovered. Uh, at Jodrell Bank, and these are stars that can spin uh, very, very quickly. Uh, so each click you're about to hear is a spinning of a pulsar and, you, and, and the sort of jet that's emanated from one of the poles coming around and back at you, kind of like a lighthouse. So for something that's um, you know, several uh, probably about the size of the Earth in this case, uh, spinning roughly once a second. It's got it's quite a lot of energy going on uh, in there and, and really quite a, a lovely thing. You see it's also irregular, so each time it spins around it's got a, a different sonic profile. It's another way of, of listening to uh, some of the crazy objects in the world. Um, that was quite a slow pulsar. Uh, so pulsars can get a lot quicker. Uh, they go up, you, you actually have millisecond pulsars that are spinning thousands of times a second. But to take one that's spinning 174 times a second, that would sound a bit like this. So quite, you can start to get sort of tones coming out of that. And uh, it's quite kind of interesting uh, phenomena that it's also at a roughly equivalent range to that we can do a direct mapping uh, from the sort of frequency of, of the spin into uh, something we can hear. Um, and if you take that to another extreme, and this, this is a, a computer simulation uh, about to play where there's 22 pulsars in a particular cluster all spinning at different rates, um, you, can, you can get some quite kind of curious um, Curious Sounds is quite a lovely animation as well. So you can hear this sort of cacophony of uh, different pulsars all spinning around there and, and all, at, all at different frequencies. So th this kind of fascination with um, Sound and astronomy is, is goes back a long, long way. And if you kind of go back to early representations of, of the universe, back to the sort of 1200s and Dante's universe, uh, you've got this sense that everything is spherical. So the structure of space is, is meant to be spherical. Um, and you've got the, the sphere of the moon, the sphere, sphere of Mercury, and um, the sphere of the, the Earth. And then we sort of fast forward a little bit into 1520 uh, with Copernicus. And this, this is probably one of the most significant uh, diagrams in history, actually. It's where uh, Copernicus put the sun at the center of our universe rather than the Earth. So this, this is and you have his hand annotated notes around the side of it, which are, I think are really beautiful little bits of, of script as well. But this, this is the first tr sort of transition of our thinking from an Earth-centric view of the world to a solar-centric view of the world. And 
you can take that forward a bit further to, again, still quite a long time ago, 1617, um, where a chap called Robert Fudd um, published a book called The Metaphysical, Physical and Technical History of Two Worlds, the Macrocosm and the Microcosm. You probably can't see on the projection here, but they're really fine lines. It's a really fine grid of black, effectively. Um, and it's really kind of staring into the void. And you can see lots of echoes of this in, in sort of contemporary artworks over the last century of the black square from, from Malevich. Uh, and, um, but this is, you know, 1617, around that period, really staring into a different type of universe. And I feel that that really links into another of my favorite images here, the, the cosmic microwave background radiation. So if you look into the distant past of the, of the universe, it's got a background temperature, a remnant from the Big Bang. And you have this very uh, faint signal that has uh, very uh, tiny fluctuations in it, but very material fluctuations. And I'll come back to this again in, in a moment. And then you kind of fast forward again to, to 1845, where William Parsons, who was an astronomer, built one of the, at the time the biggest uh, telescope in the world, and made a drawing of a galaxy. Uh, and that drawing made its way uh, to a particular asylum where a painter, a small unknown painter called Vincent van Gogh, was was uh, resident. And you can see startling similarities here between the drawings uh, of, made by the astronomer and the the paintings of uh, van Gogh. And Skipping around a bit here on, on uh, sort of timelines, but 1750, this was the first, one of the first drawings of where someone had conceptualized the fact that there might be multiple galaxies. So how, maybe we're not the center of the universe, maybe we're uh, actually just part of a galaxy and there's lots of these other sort of spheres. So it was an, a theory of a new hypothesis of the universe, uh, a finite view of infinity. Um, and you compare that to our contemporary computer models. This is a computer model uh, of the large scale structure of the universe, about 100 million light years across. And you could see these kind of patterns emerging, you see these wonderful um, spider-like uh, tendrils and, and meshes forming. So there's been this sort of common visual language and, and um, loads of some metaphors being developed over the centuries here about how we try and understand where we are in the universe. And when we look forward to more um, contemporary uh, science, and particularly the theories around general relativity, we start to see these really unusual structures. We start to see the fact that space-time it's, itself is, is bent, it's lens, it can create lensing artifacts. And this is a, an image of a, a galaxy that is sitting behind probably a quasar or something that is incredibly massive. And the structure uh, of the uh, galaxy uh, in the, that is behind this object is being literally bent around the whole star. So you can see this very strange kind of uh, lensing artifact, but this is in four dimensions, obviously. This is the warping of space-time itself uh, due to gravity. So you get these kind of uh, uh, other ways of thinking about the structure of the universe. There's another example where there's um, a quasar somewhere in the mix here, and it's literally bending the light around, and lots of seemingly kind of quite random ways. But these objects, these uh, objects circled in uh, red are the, are the same galaxy that have been twisted and bent around in, in this sort of strange geometry uh, that uh, is represented in, in Einstein's equations around you know, how does gravity bend space-time. Um, and very uh, recently, we've had the discovery uh, and measurement of gravitational waves. And again, we can listen to them. It's a really spectacular noise of two black holes colliding. And, and these are, um, I think, 100, 100, uh, 100 times the mass of the sun. Uh, so take the sun times, times 100, smash them together, and... It's a really unimpressive noise, just kind of blip. That's it. It's massive cataclysmic, cataclysmic kind of uh, event on an unimaginable scale, and it just kind of sounds like this little blip. And it's really unemotive, actually. Um, so, why am I interested in all this, bringing all this stuff together? So, I, I, I love things at um, span multiple uh, types of scale. And I love the fact that in astronomy and astrophysics, you deal with the kind of smallest units of, of time, 10 to minus 43 seconds, Planck time, uh, 
the very early origins of the universe up to power 10 to the 24 number of stars in the universe. Um, so the fact that we have this ridiculous scale in our uh, universe is, is quite astonishing. Um, it is quite absurd. And there's a great quote from Heisenberg uh, who questions, you know, can, can nature truly be this absurd? And what you're seeing here on the, on the screen is a picture of massive jets coming out of a uh, quasar. Uh, and these things are light years uh, across. And you can look at them in, in different frequencies. You can look at them uh, with different spectra. Uh, the dark image there at the top in the middle is the infrared. Uh, actually, I think that's the X-ray spectrum uh, moving across uh, to the one in the bottom right there, which is uh, a radial spectrum. So you get these very, very radically different ways of, of observing objects uh, at these different scales. And there's another part of this which I also like to mash up. And this is, as I said in my sort of brief synopsis of, you know, this is mashing up quite random sets of ideas. Um, one of the things I loved about studying astrophysics with ma was the mathematics. And there's a really interesting kind of evolution in mathematics, which is when you're doing undergrad, the maths looks very much like the top part of this uh, image. And it just gets more and more complex. You start doing more and more complex matrices. You know, everything turns into like these massive mess of paper and, and, and symbols everywhere. But as you get more advanced in the mathematics, it actually simplifies. Uh, it brings itself down into uh, you know, when you do uh, later stage mathematics, doing tensor calculus. It starts to reduce down to things like this uh, Einstein tensor at the bottom here, um, which you can represent an entire geometry of a potential universe in a few characters. So it's this really kind of visual elegance that emerges uh, as we actually understand the structure and nature of the universe better. I think this kind of echoed a lot in the earlier visuals and in, in some of the, the sounds that we listen to. As we, we kind of evolve our understanding, new types of simplicity uh, emerge. And the, one of the things that ties this all together is the idea of music of the spheres. So this is a concept that there were particular mathematical relationships between the distances between the planets and their orbits and the nature of our space, which were directly relevant to harmony, musical harmony. And people have been exploring this for centuries. Uh, Kepler was a big fan. Einstein was a really big fan of trying to find these correlations uh, between uh, the mathematics of the heavens and the mathematics of the universe and musical structure. And this is really music, music thought, not really thought of as an audible sound, uh, but as a mathematical transformation. So are there harmonies in the universe that we can somehow discover? And where are those patterns and how do you even start looking for those patterns uh, as you kind of go out on, on this sort of search? And you know, we can look back to people really trying to find literal translations between spherical orbits of planets and uh, harmony that's used in, in uh, religious music. So the, this overwhelming desire for there to be a correlation, even if there isn't, um, and there isn't in, in this case. Um, but you then look at the, the sort of evolution of language and evolution over the last uh, century or so. Uh, we, we've created new types of sound from scratch, uh, electronic music, electronic sounds that simply couldn't have existed before. Up until the invention of electronic music, every sound that we heard has a had a causal link with its source. And this term acousmatic was um, originally uh, created, I think, around uh, cinema sound. So you had this kind of recorded sound, you had a different sound world where you couldn't necessarily hear, or so you couldn't necessarily see the originating causality of that sound, but you could hear it. And actually there's a really curious link there back to Pyth Pythagorean times, where he used to lecture from behind a screen so that his students couldn't see him. So they'd really have to listen and pay attention to the words. Um, so this idea of abstracting the visual and the causal creation of sound uh, from what you're listening to, I think is a really interesting concept. And at least just to think about a sound world, it's not a space that we can enter because it physically doesn't exist. It only exists in a digital form uh, or an analog uh, recorded form. <clears throat> so it's a world that we can't enter into, but we have to kind of treat it at a distance. And so this has led me to kind of look into the evolution of la how, how we even describe music and what's, what language have we used to describe music over the centuries? Uh, and I've kind of got to this point where if you go back right to the, the 1400s, 
you'd really have monophonic music, there'd be a, a huge emphasis on pitch, and that would be manifested as things like chant. Uh, and gradually we developed this idea of polyphony and harmony, and we'd have madrigals and uh, baroque music. And so you can see a kind of complexity emerging as we start to understand the nature of our universe better. There's a parallel here. And then with the advent of, of Bach and Mozart and Handel, you started to have more form and harmony and, and refinement in that sort of complexity. And that then evolved into s symphonic music, operatic music, the kind of romantic period of uh, Beethoven, Wagner, and so on. Um, so you've got this increasing complexity as the, again, reflecting our culture, reflecting our understanding of the world. And then there's this really interesting phase when, as Einstein uh, and others revealed some of the mathematics behind the nature of the universe, as we started to understand our place in it better, we had this strange parallel of uh, composers like Messian in the early uh, 1900s creating very dissonant music. So this language changed, it became much more mathematical uh, through to Philip Glass later in, in the century or John, John Cage, uh, where they're really using mathematics as a basis for the music they're writing and using prime numbers or um, very uh, algorithmic kind of roots to what they were creating. Again, this was echoing a cultural phenomena of well, what, what are we actually building here? And obviously with the advent of computing, that has gone uh, a huge stage forward. And over the last 30, probably 40 years now, uh, with people like Trevor Wishart, developing a language of music, uh, electronic music that they were creating, which uses words like mass, texture, grain, or lattice. Uh, so you've got this evolution again, completely parallel with the scientific evolution and computing revolution um, that we can map through centuries here. And so my, one of my questions is what, what next as we start to develop completely new forms of manipulating the microstructure of sound as well as its macro environment as we get better at VR and AR type materials, we're really going to start unpacking these different worlds that can't exist yet we're in them and that experientially they're going to feel like we're in them except they physically don't exist. So are we going to start using words like curvature or gravitation, symmetry, spin in the, def in the characterization of the music that we are creating and listening to or the soundscapes that we're creating and listening to? So that's, that's kind of my, one of my kind of questions that I'm really keen to debate with everybody is what's the language we're going to use to describe algal rave? Because it's really difficult, you know. You try and say, how how would you describe Algorave to your friends? Well, I I've, I've been trying to do it for 15 years. It doesn't work. You have to go to it. Um, so we haven't developed that language yet to say it, it's kind of this category, and that's fascinating because for me it's at the kind of very early stages of a new genre of music. And obviously, then I, t I take it a bit of a step further because uh, I'm a cosmology geek and say, once, rather than just music of the spheres, watch the music of the n-dimensional hypercube, uh, just as a bit of a provocative statement. How do we start using different structures? Are there uh, correlations we can make between uh, the, the structure of the universe and the music that we're creating? People have been trying to do this for centuries. Why should we stop doing it? Let's use the new tools that we've got. Let's use these kind of new ideas. Um, whether there's a correlation or not, whether it's there's certainly unlikely to be uh, causation, but I'm sure there'll be some really interesting correlations. Um, so that's that's a, an area that I'm very uh, keen to explore. And this is a, a wonderful uh, galaxy. It has a very kind of fetal-like um, uh, look to it. That uh, This is a Hubble Space Telescope image but then the uh, ALMA array in, in Chile, which is an incredibly powerful uh, array of radio telescopes, started doing the uh, radio uh, spectrum of, of part of that uh, galaxy. I'm just going to loop through here, and there's a little, uh, what's called a data cube. And the, the animation that you're seeing uh, on the screen there is it's, it's going through each layer of the galaxy and looking at the redshift or the blue shift, if something's moving towards you, it's blue shifted. If it's red shift, it's moving away from you. The key thing here is that each, spe each individual pixel from that radio uh, image is actually a spectrum. Uh, so as you go through there, you, you're actually seeing multiple uh, different frequencies for every single pixel in the image. So what we've done there uh, now is, and I'll play this in just a second, is taking that data cube, because it is a you know, two by two image, but it has a has a depth, and transformed uh, the uh, e each 
element into a color. We've also transformed it into a sound. So I'm going to now play the galaxy. Uh, so this is a, an image of the, um, let me just make that larger, um, of the radio cube. And if I scroll over here, you can see each individual pixel has its own spectrum. So you can start to listen to the structure of the spiral arms. And you can tell that this arm here on the uh, right hand side is uh, has a section in the middle that's moving away. Uh, on the top left there's a blue bit so that's moving towards you. So that's higher, higher frequency. So we're starting to work out how to, to play galaxies, which is quite nice an idea. Um, that's all uh, open source on uh, my GitHub uh, repository um, and keen to, to take that forward. But I don't want to stop there because really what I want to do is think back to the cosmic microwave backgrounds and think, well, what, what, what's the larger space-time structure that we might be in? And it's, it's quite interesting because we, we think we've got good theoretical models of what the structure of the universe might be, uh, but we don't know for sure. And there's, there's lots of different models uh, that may or may not fit uh, the universe we're in. And my favorite is, uh, or one of my favorites, is a dodecahedral space. So I'm just going to drop out of this again and go to a visualization of a dodecahedral space. So here we've, we've got the, the Earth um, and it's spinning away, but if I start taking away some of the edges here, you can start to see we. If, I, if anyone saw the, the uh, how to think, uh, how to visualize uh, hypercubes the other night, this, this, that would have been a very useful thing to have gone to as a precursor to this. Uh, but the principle here is you can then start navigating through these multidimensional spaces. Um, and maybe we exist in a space that is um, unimaginably complicated for us to actually visualize. But this, in some cases, you see in the cosmic microwave background, some, some people think that they found patterns that indicate we might be in a geometry that isn't kind of flat. It might be much more complex. For example, it's a dodecahedral space. So what I'm really keen to do is use these, the mathematics behind this as a way of manipulating sound, as a way of manipulating filters, as a way of evolving uh, synthesis, as a way of evolving the compositional structure or the narrative of the music that I write. And how can we use these kind of theoretical constructs and mathematical constructs to then affect uh, the sound, sound spaces that we exist in? Um, so I'm going to um, finish off just with a, a couple of things. Um, one. It's just in terms of what I'm trying to uh, look at here and I'm really keen to discuss with people is if we're looking at the mathematics of structure as spoken through grains of rendered sound, uh, how can we start bringing together these mathematical constructs, ways of listening to them, ways of sonifying them, ways of visualizing them that gives us a different kind of insight into why we're here and what, uh, what the structure is of the spaces that we're looking at. And I think it's got a whole range of different applications, uh, obviously in, in better understanding of cosmology, uh, also in terms of how do we evolve the language of music itself. And I'm going to finish just with a tiny excerpt of a, a piece of music that uses uh, some of this uh, mathematics, um, some of the uh, processes and, and things that I've touched on to affect uh, a whole range of different sounds in a composition. I'll just, I'll just play it. Just a really short excerpt from from one of uh, one of the pieces I've written that uses lots of different filtering techniques, lots of different time stretching techniques, um, lots of different geometric techniques to change the way that the filters and the sounds are all, are all processed. Um, I think that's my thirty minutes up, but very happy to take questions uh, now, or we can chat outside over a beer. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Sorry, thank you very much. So, yeah, we've got time for a few questions. Um, I must say, N Dimensional Hypercube does sound like a very good name for a band. But, uh, and uh, so I've got one. So, effectively, from what you're saying, it sounds like um, there's a possible causal link between how we understand musical structure and the fundamental nature of the universe. Would you would you postulate I, I, that? I think there's a really deep cultural link. I think that's that's a, the the and I, I realise I've just poured a lot of different strands together. I've pulled a lot of different strands together there. But the, the the pattern that I think I'm seeing is that when we look throughout history, there are people who are really trying to f work out you know what the hell are we and why we're we here and what's the structure of the space that we're in. But they pull whatever resources that they have around them to try and make sense of that. And when you look at um, the the fact that um, there's a direct uh, link between um, the physics of, uh, say, the height of a column in a cathedral uh, and the resonant frequency. This was before we understood you know, the nature of pressure dynamics, for example, in, in sound. We've always found ways of, of bringing together in unexpected ways uh, mathematics that we didn't quite understand, uh, musical structure that we didn't quite understand, and then form a language around that that ends up being common uh, without designing it to be. You know, they, they start, these things sort of inherit from each other. Uh, so there's this kind of really interesting, maybe starts with a correlation or starts with a desire for a co correlation and then some, somewhere along the line we might find some co causation. So it would be a bit of a stretch to say that uh, Algo Rave was a direct um, predetermined um, fact from Big Bang. Well, maybe it was. Yeah, that, wouldn't that happened, be exciting? <laughs> Okay. Sorry. Uh, do we have any other questions from anyone? Uh, oh, yep. <laughs> um, I've got one job to do. <laughs> um, yeah. What? Uh, so there's a whole bunch of different new telescopes and observational arrays coming online. So what? What is the most exciting from your point of view? Uh, I think the most well the most current um, the, there's the new radio square kilometer array SKA uh, that's been built that uh, is a radio telescope array that's going to be quite phenomenal um, and obviously the gravitational uh, wave detectors uh, some of my friends worked on that for their PhDs 20 years ago and it's amazing to see that sort of longitudinal um, energy spent and then producing a result decades later. So I think there you know much as we just simply we don't quite know what we're going to find when we observe more uh, objects or observe uh, more uh, gravitational waves, <clears throat> the more we can find different ways of interpreting those signals, interpreting uh, ways of thinking about this, I think the better, and how we'll find completely different ways of thinking about the science, thinking about the art, is by bringing them together. And you know, it is a, sim a relatively recent phenomena where we treat them as separate disciplines. It used to be the case that art and science were just the same set of things that we would study. Um, and we've kind of lost that as we've siloed each of our disciplines. So I think there's a lot of really interesting things to do in terms of bringing to bring back together some of the incredible things like, you know, mash up algorithm with some of the gravitational wave stuff and so on to find out, well, what do we find out? That's the nature of research we don't know. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Actually, I've got one more while I think about it. Um, I was recently in uh, in France and Brittany on holiday, and uh, one of the things we visited there was the um, the antenna installation where they picked up the first um, transatlantic satellite communications. And there they had a 30 meter um, giant horn antenna, which picked up the first transmissions, which were about a millionth of a millionth of a watt, which was pretty impressive for the 60s and you know mm. receiving that. The gravitational waves that you played the music on. How, in context, comparison to that, how weak is it possible oh, to comprehend blimey. the weakness of that? Uh, or? Yeah, I, have, I, I should have looked up my analogies for, for that, that <laughs> reference. Um, I can't tell you off the top of my head, but yeah, unimaginably small. Unimaginably small. I mean, they've, they've been building these detectors for decades. They've been running them for uh, decades as well, I think, now. And, and it's just the, 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 the wobble that you're looking at is, I think, the equivalent of the Earth flexing a millionth of a millimetre or something. It's, it's some ridiculously tiny amount. Pretty amazing. Cool. Equivalent of, of that. Okay. Sorry, did we have a question at the back? Or was that just someone moving around? No. Okay, cool. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Oh, okay, thank you very much indeed. Thanks.